Glad you could join us this morning on this Palm Sunday. It's just kind of a different day. No doubt, uh, this is not quite the Palm Sunday that we envisioned. I'm sure that we all envisioned something a little bit different. I'm sure that we all felt like, you know, when I think of Palm Sunday, I think of of a packed house. I think of waving palm branches. I think of exuberant worship and, and an inspiring message and and, you know, a full worship band and all the things that come with it. Well, this morning has been a little bit different than I think we anticipated. But my goal this morning is to still give you the word of God and that you will leave this morning as we have our time together inspired. Because I believe that despite the circumstances that we find ourselves facing today, that it doesn't change the fact of what this, may, this day means. You know, it's just that sometimes in life, we don't get what we expect. Kind of like the teacher that was teaching her Sunday school class, and she had this class of little kids, and she was explaining to them about things, and she began to ask some questions to see what kind of knowledge they had. And so she said, uh, she said, how many of you know that today is Palm Sunday? Who can tell me what that means? A little girl raised her hand and said, I know, I know. And she said to her teacher, she said, you know what? She said, she said, teacher, she said, I know that this is the day that Jesus rode the donkey into Jerusalem. And the people waved their palm branches and they laid stuff on the roads for him. And the teacher was very excited that this little girl had the right answer. And this, this she said, the teacher asked another question. She said, she said, what is coming up next Sunday? And the same little girl raised her hand and said, I know, I know. And she said, next Sunday is Easter Sunday. And the teacher was just, wow, this, this kid's got it. You know, I'm doing a great job as a teacher. And then she said, well, what is, what is so significant about Easter Sunday? And the same little girl raised her hand. I know, I know. She said that, that what this means is that it's the day that we celebrate that Jesus rose from the grave. I mean, the teacher is just grinning from ear to ear that this child is getting this. And then the teacher, then the kid, child out of the blue comes back and says, and if Jesus sees his shadow, he has to go back in the tomb for six weeks. <laughs> so sometimes we don't get what we expected. But I want to give you a little bit of a history of Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday began to be celebrated somewhere in the first 300 years of the uh, early church. The early church, it, it became this thing that was celebrated, this thing that was remembered that, uh, that forever, kind of forever changed how that we, we see this week and this time. And, and, uh, but Palm Sunday originally, and we still look at it that way today, is really kind of the, the first week or the first day of what we call the Passion Week, the first day when we began to, because Jesus went into Jerusalem knowing what he was going into Jerusalem for and what was going to take place and how that was going to impact the world and people's lives. During that time, though, during the Passover time, it was a time that many, many people would show up to Jerusalem and they were the pilgrims would come in for all over and they were getting ready for the Passover season as this is this huge national holiday and, and the place was just crowded with people and all the activities that they had to accomplish. People had to get there and they had to get their, their they had to bring their lambs that they were going to sacrifice. Uh, they had to get that ready and the lambs had to be inspected because they had to be spotless and without blemish and it was all a part of the process. And But you can imagine the hustle and bustle that took place in the city because during this time, what would take place is that you would have all of these people come in. A, a town, a community that is, is estimated that there were about 500,000 people that lived in Jerusalem at that time. In a matter of days, it would swell from 500,000, roughly a half a million, to over 2 million people packed into that region for this season. So it was an incredible time. It was just all the, all the markets that were open, all the things that were having place where people would have to come and buy their, their wares to prepare for this season. And uh, during this time, the interesting thing is, is obviously there weren't enough inns or places people could stay. Literally, most every home in Jerusalem had guests or family members that they would welcome in. So the place was just packed. 
So this is kind of the scene that Jesus rode into on that day when he came riding in on the donkey as all this is happening in Jerusalem. It was the most crowded time of the year that he could go into Jerusalem and begin to, to share and to be and to do what he was doing. So as he was going in, we know that he sent his disciples on ahead and he told them, he said, go find, go into this village that's ahead just outside of Jerusalem and you will find a donkey, you will find a colt tied to there and just take it. And if somebody comes to you and says, hey, uh, why are you taking this? Just say the master has need of it. And so that's kind of what took place. But this morning, I want to catch up with that story in Matthew 27, 7 through 9. And it says this, they brought the donkey and the colt and put, their, put on them their cloaks. And he sat on them, most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and the others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. You know, the people saw him, and they begin to cry out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They were looking for something. They were looking for a leader. They were looking for the Messiah. And they've been taught about this from the time that they were little. It was so much a part of their culture and their religion and their life. And so they were looking for this Messiah. And as they were looking for this, and as Jesus came in, there were some things that, that kind of made many of them believe that perhaps Jesus, Jesus is this Messiah. This is also a very patriotic time for, even though they were under Roman rule, it was very much a patriotic time where they were looking to the idea that one day there was supposed to come a Messiah. One day they would become a nation again. One day they would be, step out and become what they felt that they were supposed to be. And could this Jesus be the one that does that? Because while they were looking to be set free, while they knew that the Messiah would come and would save them, they were really looking for more of a political savior than a spiritual savior. And so that's what they were looking at. And so I want you to think of this for a moment. I, perhaps you've never thought of this in this fashion, but Jesus had already shown his power by the working of miracles. So if you were looking for a Messiah, if you were looking for someone who could, could, could be out there and could begin to change your circumstance, he would be the one. So you can imagine this, this, this fervor and this nationalism that was beginning to rise up and they were underneath this rule. And one scholar put it this way that I found. I thought this was an interesting perspective on this. One scholar I read wrote that waving the palm branches was almost like them waving their national flag because of the level of nationalism that they were looking for. And could this Jesus be the one? Because not only did he work miracles, this same Jesus had proven that he had the capability of feeding an army with five loaves and two fishes. Amen. They were looking for a spiritual revolution, so to speak, and not, not spiritual per se, but, it, but, but patriotic. So when Jesus came in fulfilling Zechariah 9.9, riding on the donkey, you can just understand why there began to be this celebration, why there was this, ignite, this excitement, and they begin to cry, Hosanna in the highest. And just like them, they, they thought of one thing, but Jesus came in with a different plan. Jesus came in with a different purpose. They were looking for a political savior he came to be their spiritual savior, the savior of their souls. Isn't it just like God that just when we think we have things figured out, just when we think that we know exactly how he's going to do something and what's best, he comes along and says, no, I've got a little bit different plan in mind. Yes. So just like them, I want us to understand some this morning, Jesus didn't come to save you from your everyday circumstances, per se. Jesus came to save you from your sin. Now, I know right now we're, we're all concerned about sickness and things, and we're probably all practicing better um, 
hygiene than we ever have. I know that I've washed my hands many multiple times a day, more than I normally would have, and we're probably all in that mode, and, and we're all concerned about being so physically clean, but we know that Jesus came in reality to make us spiritually clean. Amen. His primary mission wasn't what the people thought. And the funny thing is that even his disciples kind of had their minds set on this, this political savior. Because we find in Acts, after Jesus rose from the dead, in Acts chapter 1, some of them pulled Jesus aside and said, Lord, at this time, are you going to restore the kingdom? They were still looking for him to do that. And his answer was, it's not for you to know the time, but for my father to know the time. And so even though these people were looking for this, this conquering lion of the tribe of Judah, what they got was a lamb being led to the slaughter. You know, this was not how they expected to be saved. They were expecting something completely different. So this morning, I want us over the next few minutes to take some time and dig a little deeper into this thought, into this idea what is interesting is that though they didn't truly understand what he came to do, they, were, they misidentified his purpose, but at the same time when they were shouting the words Hosanna, they were more on target than they thought. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about Hosanna identified. Because salvation has arrived. This is an incredible moment. Salvation has arrived. It's a part of what they were doing. And, and, and you, just the worship that broke out. Now, I'm a worshiper. I, I know that some people, maybe that's, they don't think that is their thing, but I, I'm a worshiper. There is just something about when, when we sing songs that speak of who Jesus is and, and, and what he's done, and, and there's a power that there's, there's some songs in that area that move me like nothing else. I love worshiping. I love just getting lost. Even, even on a Sunday morning when we used to have the auditorium full of people, I would still lose myself in worship at, at times almost as if it was just me and God because I love interacting with with my Savior in that fashion. But as I was thinking about this, can you imagine how different it would be if somehow we could go and we could stand in that moment when Jesus is, is entering into Jerusalem and he knows full well why he's going. He knows full well what's awaiting for him inside that city and what's going to be transpiring that there's this that he's literally going fast forward now to the cross even though nobody else understood exactly what was happening but can you imagine what it'd be like to go and stand and be a part of that worshiping crowd with the knowledge we have today of his purpose I can't imagine what it'd be like to sit there and watch that scene of him riding that coat into Jerusalem, knowing what awaits him, knowing that the crowd is, is shouting Hosanna, and they really don't even fully know and understand what they're saying and what is taking place. You know, from that moment on, Hosanna would have a whole new meeting. You know, and it should we should think of this word as a celebration because that was a celebration, but they, they were a little off on what they were celebrating, even though he was coming to be the Savior. So let's look at this word Hosanna for just a few moments. Hosanna actually is an English word that we use, but its original comes from the Greek, and it was pronounced the same, Hosanna. But if you take it back a little further, all the way back to its beginning, it has its original root as a Hebrew word, hoshiana. Hoshiana means, literally has a slightly different meaning. It was a Hebrew, it's actually a Hebrew phrase, and if you look in the Old Testament, there's only one place in all the Old Testament where that word is found, and that's found in 18, Psalms 118, verse 25, and it says this, save us, we pray, O oh Lord, O oh Lord, we pray, give us success. Now, it used to be that its original meaning literally is that first part, save us. You know, when somebody 
pushes you into the deep end of the pool and you don't know how to swim, the first thing you're going to say when you come up is, save me, somebody save me. In a sense, that's what it was. Hoshiana, Hoshiana, I'm in over my head. Help me, save me. Now, if you look at it in that context, I want you to look at what verse 26 says. To me, this is so powerful. We probably haven't even put this together. But the very next verse, verse 26, that was literally written centuries before Jesus went into Jerusalem, says this. He just said, save me, and it says, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Does that sound familiar? Seems like we've heard that somewhere before, hadn't we? But you see, something, somewhere along the line, through the years, something different happened to that phrase. Somewhere along the line, Hosanna had changed its meaning to Hosanna. And somewhere along the centuries, it stopped being a cry for help. And it's meant that my salvation has come, that salvation has arrived, that salvation is here. Think about that. It used to be that you would say when you fell out of that boat, Hosiana, but now that you're, but once you're standing on the, on the banks, once you're saved, once you're secure, all of a sudden you don't need to say that anymore. You need to say Hosanna. You need to say, I am saved. Salvation has come. Amen. So think about that. If you look at that and you go back through and you begin to look at the other phrases that were said, Hosanna to the son of David literally means the son of David is our salvation. Praise to the king. Salvation belongs to the king. And it goes on and it says, Hosanna in the highest. It literally means let all heaven, let all the angels, let the world, let all creation rejoice that salvation has come. That ought to be something that excites us today. I realize you may be at home, you may be hunkered down and locked in, but your salvation has come. You are saved. Now, I believe the crowds that welcomed Jesus truly believed that, that he was one that had come to save him. But they were looking at a different kind of save. Many believe that he was the Messiah. But they simply mistook his purpose thinking that he had come to fix their world and to fix their circumstance in the here and now. They had no idea that he had come to fix their eternity. So today, we must be careful getting all caught up in this idea and getting caught up in the way of thinking, especially when it means because of the circumstances we face today. Sometimes that's all we can think about. Sometimes all we can think about is, when can this be made right? When can my life go back to the way it used to be? And that's the mistake that the Jews made at the beginning, is when they saw Jesus coming in, they were like, finally somebody's come that is going to save us and is going to put our nation back the way it used to be. And I understand that. I can't wait until things get a little more back to the way it used to be. I can't wait till I'm not just standing here with a couple of free technical people and staring at a camera. I can't wait until the auditorium is, is full again and we're singing Hosanna with all of us in one accord in one place. But sometimes nothing can give us peace in those moments like the idea that the lamb who was sacrificed for my salvation holds my future no matter what is going on in the world around me. I want you to hold on to this thought and this statement this morning. Hosanna! Because the lamb of God was sacrificed, I am saved. It doesn't matter what happens around me. Oh, there's things I want. I'm praying for my family to be healthy. I'm praying for all of you to be healthy. I'm praying for things to return to more like they used to be. But I hope that we return back to life different than we were before. I hope this has been a wake-up call to us that we really can focus back on the true important things and we can focus our thoughts and our ideas and our minds on truly being connected with God like we need to be. Because in a moment's time, like we've seen, what example, in a moment's time, what we consider so unshakable can be shaken. So I want us to look at that conquering lamb for a moment. Truly spotless lamb. According to their traditions, four days before the Passover, the people of Israel were required to present their lambs to the priests for inspection. 
This was known as inspection day. Law had very tight and very strict uh, specifications and, and restrictions on what they could bring and what they could present. So as a result of all that, people didn't want to bring a lamb all the way from home wherever they were traveling from. They didn't want to bring that just to get there and say, well, that's not good enough. So many of them would buy their lamb, they'd buy their sacrifices, they'd buy their supplies once they got to Jerusalem. So this created a circumstance. It, it created a, where well, there was markets all over that were selling these things. And, and so they would buy those. And in Jesus' day, though, the problem was that the priesthood wasn't always trustworthy. And so many times they would, they would buy their, their lamb in some other market and they would bring it to be inspected by one of the priests who would sit there and look that lamb over and if you really think about it, if you had a not-so-integrity-bound priest, it would be easy for them to look and try to find something wrong with that lamb. Oh, that one's not good enough. It's got this defect. But I have good news for you. I have one right over here that is perfectly spotless, and you can purchase that one right here now, and we can get that taken care of, and I will pay you a little bit for your trade-in on the one that's flawed. Now, I don't know about you, but I can just picture there was probably a little bit of this turning around and then selling the one that was flawed to the one person, and the next person, all of a sudden, that particular lamb is this spotless lamb. And so they were, there was money being made there. Then you had the money changers. You had those that were there that, that because of circumstances, you, you couldn't, you um, only certain corn coins were acceptable. Only certain uh, types of money were acceptable. So if you had the wrong type, then they could also help you out there. They could exchange your money for the acceptable currency for a small fee. So no wonder when Jesus showed up on the scene, no wonder he was upset. No wonder he began to turn the tables on and, and over and drive people out and saying that my father's house is supposed to be a house of prayer and you made it a den of thieves. Also on this day, though, and this is the, one of the neat things, also on this day is that we would see this incredible thing happen. We would, you would see that the, the high priest would have selected the spotless lamb, the one that was truly the best that the nation had to offer. And as part of the parade that took place, the priest would walk that lamb through the crowd into the temple courtyard where the lamb would be put out there and put in place. And so you can imagine the spectacle as he walks by with the lamb that was going to be sacrificed for the sins of a nation. And as he walked in with that lamb, you can just imagine the worship and the, and the thing that began to took place as that was being done. But you know, there's a good chance that right on the heels of that lamb being led into the city came the real lamb riding on a colt. The crowd was already assembled. They were already looking for the sacrificial lamb, and here comes Jesus, the real sacrificial lamb. Not the one for the sins of a nation, but the one for the sins of the world. And as he came in, and as he rolled through, no wonder worship broke out. Just picture that. That Jesus, literally in that moment, was identifying himself as the Lamb of God. The one that would take away the sins of the world. Matter of fact... He was fulfilling what the prophet Isaiah centuries before had said in Isaiah 53, verse 7, where it says this. He says, He was oppressed, he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. We know that later on, as Jesus was arrested and was being, and was being uh, interrogated, that many times he kept his mouth shut because he knew he had a purpose, and his purpose was to be that sacrificial lamb. So just think of the enthusiasm that 
filled the town that day. Just think of all these things. I mean, we could literally spend hours going through all the prophecies of old that were fulfilled in just this one act of Jesus uh, entering into the city and him riding in and the things that just fell in place that were talked about centuries before. But we know that the high priest would then take the lamb that was the lamb for the nation. He would take it in and he would sit it up in the courtyard. He would sit it up where not only had the priests inspected it, but that people could come by and they could inspect the lamb. They could see the lamb that was going to be sacrificed for the sins of their nation. They could inspect it. They could, in their own hearts and minds, verify that it was fulfilling the requirements and that it was a spotless lamb. So I was working on this. I had an interesting thought. You know, in the same way, Jesus put himself up for inspection. How many times did he have, did he have conversations with priests and, and Pharisees and Sadducees and people that tried their best to pick apart and find every little flaw in him they could find? Again and again, they set verbal traps for him. Again and again, they tried to find fault. And again and again, he would come out still spotless and still right. And they were so frustrated. So no wonder later on, they had to resort to making up lies. They had to bear false testimony to bring him to the place that he would go to the cross. Because Jesus presented himself and proved to be the spotless lamb for the sins of the world. No wonder he made the crooked priest of his day so angry at him. No wonder when he was riding in on that Palm Sunday as he was passing through to the worship and the crowd and the waving of the palms and the, and the making and, and of a makeshift red carpet was laid out before him and all the things that took place. No wonder they were the ones that were standing on the sidelines with their arms folded, looking at it all with a critical eye and walking up to him and declaring and demanding that he would, should tell those people to be quiet. Yet one of my favorite passages of Scripture is when he said, I tell you the truth, if these be quiet, even the stones are going to cry out. Amen. See, to me, there was something. I don't know how it works. This is one of those questions. I probably won't care when I get there, but in the back of my mind, I want to know, okay, what is it? How is it that even creation itself knew, would know that it was about to be redeemed? See, all knew, Israel knew that one day there would be a Messiah that would come into Jerusalem and that he would be enthroned as king. They all knew this would happen, and they knew that he would come, but they didn't understand that he would come at first as a lamb riding on a donkey and that's significant because if you're a conquering king, you didn't come in on a lowly donkey on a colt. That was a sign of peace. If you were a conquering, conquering king, you came in on a horse. But the good news is he will return as a conquering king. And we know that he will be riding a white horse and he will be coming and he will establish his kingdom. And you and I are a part of making the way for that kingdom when we share his word. We're a part of being a part of that and we worship him in his spirit and truth. We understand that we're in that in-between time that the price has already been paid. Hoshiata has happened for us. We are saved. But during that time, we know that one day he will make it right. One day his kingdom will be established. And now is the time to spread the word for what he has done. Hosanna, because the lamb of God that was sacrificed, because of that, I am saved. And if you're giving your life to Christ, you are saved. Isn't that great? Isn't that, doesn't that give us comfort to know that no matter what circumstances we face, that we are still in the palm of the hands of the King of kings and the Lord of lords? But before that to happen, before he could conquer death, he had to conquer death with his blood. So let's talk about the Passover shield as we move to a close this morning. Is the blood applied? See, the original purpose of the whole thing, I, I love Scripture. I, you know, I, obviously I do, but have you ever really thought through 
how incredible it is. I know there are people that try to pick the Bible apart, but to me there's so much just that proves it is right and is accurate and we can take it word for word. There is no part that's valid and no part that isn't valid. It's the, the, the word of God, the infallible word of God, and we know that it is alive and that it is powerful. But yet when we look at it, it's so neat to know that, that even though there's all these 66 different books and there are all these different people that the Holy Spirit inspired to write these and it's spread out over centuries, yet it has the one same message and it all ties together. And God ties all these things in just a neat little bow in a package that the deeper you dig, the more you find that this part backs up that part. And it's an incredible package and we see this. So we see in, even in this story that the original purpose of the Passover was to celebrate the children of Israel being set free for them actually becoming a nation. Now, if you spend any time in Sunday school at all, you understand you, where, how Moses came along and the children were in slavery and captivity in Egypt and how that Moses challenged Pharaoh and we don't have time to go into all that. There was, a, there was a string of 10 plagues that came along to validate and to show that God is really the one in charge. And even though Pharaoh called himself a God, he was just a wannabe. And, and we see all this and, and we know that the 10th and the final plague was the plague of the firstborn. And the whole reason that the nation celebrated Passover anyway, they, because really they were celebrating the birth of their nation. Because as that, as that destroyer was coming through and was taking out the firstborn of all the children of Israel, the firstborn son I mean of, of Egypt, those that followed the instructions to sacrifice the spotless lamb took a hyssop plant, dipped it in the blood, and put it over the doorpost of the home that the destroyer would pass that home by. Amen. So this is what the Passover is all about. This is what they were celebrating. The fact that, that they were passed over, the fact that in Exodus chapter 12, as they did that, that God did this. And in a matter of days, Jesus would show himself See, you and I have a destroyer. Scripture tells us that the devil goes around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour, because he desires to destroy us. And the thing is, is just like in the Passover, that sacrificial lamb, the lamb that was slain for the sin of the world, for us to be passed over by the destroyer, we have to make sure that the blood of the lamb is applied to our lives. We must apply it because judgment is real and one day judgment will come. And for us to, to for that to pass us over, for the judgment day in a sense to pass us over, the, the blood of the lamb has to be seen as applied to our lives. See, the death of the lamb, Jesus came to give us life. And he came to give us, he came to be that Passover shield on judgment. If we receive Jesus by faith, if we yield to the tugging of the Holy Spirit as he draws us to him, and we cry out, Hoshiana, Lord, save me from my sins, that he is faithful and just, and he will do that. And when we do that, the blood is applied to our lives. See, the whole Passover idea carries the idea of a shield from the judgment to come. This really, if you look at it, gives more meaning to what Jesus would say just a couple of chapters later in Matthew 23, 37 through 39. We really catch here a picture of the heart of Jesus when he looked over the city from the hill and he said, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem the city that kills the prophets and stones those who were sent to it. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings and you were not willing. See, can you imagine his tears? And if he cried those tears over Jerusalem, just imagine as he looks at the world today and he looks at the millions upon millions upon millions of of lives 
that have not applied the blood of his sacrifice to their life. Can you imagine the tears that he cries? Because that's why he entered Jerusalem. He knew he was going in Jerusalem to face the cross. He knew what was coming. He tried to warn his disciples, and they just didn't see it. They just didn't understand it. And he was saying that what the whole world needs is the real Passover. But if you're not willing to respond, if you're not willing to come close enough to him and apply the blood of his sacrifice to your life, if you're not willing to let him be your Passover lamb and making, by making him your Lord and your king, he's your only protection from the destroyer. This morning... I want to just get real serious for a moment. Not that I haven't been before, but this is so serious and so important. Have you applied that blood to your life? Have you truly responded? How many times have, has the Holy Spirit tugged at your heart? How many times have you felt that drawing and you know that, that what you're hearing is the truth or something on the inside, but somehow we think that there's some circumstances or, or there's something better in this world or something else we want to hold on to instead of finally surrendering and saying, Lord, I need you as my Lord and Savior. Hosiana, save me. Save me from myself. Save me from my sins. Save me from the things that I put before you. I challenge you this day to respond. I challenge you this day to give your life to Christ. Let him reach in and take your Hosanna, your, your, your desire, your cry to be saved, and let him turn that into Hosanna, I am saved. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord because, the, because that king, that Lord, that Savior now reigns in my life. Hosanna, because the Lamb of God was sacrificed, I am saved. If you're here this morning, I want your, your Hosanna to be, I am saved. But first, we have to make the cry, Hosanna, Lord, save me. If you're listening to me this morning, and you feel that tug in your spirit. The Holy Spirit has to draw you. But if you feel that tug in your heart, you feel that tug in your spirit, and I want you to yield to it. I want you to, to open up your heart, and I want you to ask him. In a moment, I'm going to lead you in a prayer, and I, I would incur, highly encourage you, please, if you have not, ask him to be your Lord and Savior this day. If you're involved in one of the online chats and, and you make that decision, you pray that prayer this morning, I want you to indicate to those that are there, to our moderators, that you have, that you have done that so that we know and have record of that. We would love to know who you are and help you. But I want us to pray. We're going to pray a prayer of protection over all of us. I'm excited for next Sunday being Easter Sunday and and I'm going to be just defiant enough to go ahead and wear the Easter outfit that I was going to wear anyway. And I would challenge you. As a matter of fact, we're probably going to create a page, and I'd challenge you to, to uh, upload a picture of uh, yourself and your family dressed and what you were going to wear. But how much more, will, much more will Easter mean if we truly give our lives over to Christ? The Holy Spirit is speaking to you this morning. As I pray, I want you to ask Jesus to forgive you of your sins. Admit that you're a sinner and believe that he is the only way and then confess him with your mouth. Can we do that, Lord Jesus? I come before you today. Lord, I admit that I am a sinner. I know that my righteousness is as filthy rags. I know, Lord God, that that without you, I am nothing. There is nothing I can do to clean myself up. There is nothing I can do to save myself. That is a gift of the cross. And Lord, I fully admit that I need your salvation. So Lord, I ask you, Lord, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you are the only way. And I ask you today to come into my life 
be my Lord and Savior. And Lord, I confess you, not only as my Savior, not only as the Lamb of God that was sacrificed for the sins of the world, but I confess you as from this moment on as my King and my Lord in Jesus' name. Lord, I come before you today and I lift up those that have prayed that prayer. I lift up those that are, everybody that's in the sound of my voice and I ask you to touch them. I ask you to minister to them. I ask that they would feel your peace. Lord, today we couldn't all gather together like we would normally have done. Today we couldn't do church as usual, but Lord, we thank you that you rode in Jerusalem. We thank you that you rode into the cries of Hosanna. And I am thankful, Lord God, to be one of those that can proudly proclaim Hosanna. I am saved. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We thank you for it. We give you praise. And Lord, we ask you to be with us all in these coming days. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I am so glad you could join us today. And I hope to... See you again, I guess, or you see me next week as we join together. We're continuing to work to improve our quality and our production, and we've got some more things on order that will be coming in. And so in the coming weeks, this is going to get better and better. But thank you for joining us today. We love you, and God bless.